Hello folks, our ongoing dialogue continues. I'm Dr. Jonathan Crandon, I'm the Medical Director of Freaky Joints, a subsidiary of the Global Healthy Living Foundation, and we have with us now our patient and friend, Ten, with rheumatoid arthritis. Ten, I wonder whether you could give us a bit of an understanding of your journey with rheumatoid disease. Absolutely, so sitting, I'm, I'm on the other side of the chair today, guys. So let's see, my, um, my experience, one, started when I was 40. So I got a, a classic age, you know, and classic symptoms. All of a sudden I went from walking and running. I had done a uh, triathlon and then a month after the triathlon, I had had symptoms beforehand, but I just chalked those up to, I've been working out, you know, the aches and pains, you know, my knees would go out. I already had problems with my knees. My wrist was hurting. I thought it was because I added uh, some softball to my regular activities. And all of a sudden, it was so much pain that I drove myself one-handed to the emergency room to get something because I could not get my wrist comfortable. And to this day, no matter what medications I've taken, this wrist still hurts like the dickens. So um, fast forward a couple of years, I've had double knee replacements. Um, I've been on three different biologics. Um, for a time I was off of methotrexate, but I'm back on that now and that and Plaquenil. Um, probably going back to another biologic in the next month or so because that's what me and my rheumatologist have discussed. And um, I don't know, it's just been, um, it's a very difficult journey because I have lost my body. And it was something that I was really proud of. I worked out, I took care of myself, I ate healthy, and none of that stopped this from happening, so. This is not an unusual story. Unfortunately, I know. robust, active, physically engaged, attractive young people are affected by this autoimmune condition, which then just takes over their life. Yeah. And one of the things that we are most focused on as clinicians is the appropriate way to treat patients with disease as it evolves, because it's never static. Yes. Have you found that to be the case? Absolutely. Um, I, I remember when I, the first time when in my first years of treatment it was I had a lot of issues and I ended up in the emergency room a couple of times and I ended up staying in the hospital a couple of days and you know everything was kind of not working um, but I got on uh, a biologic immediately and once she had me on that it was like my hands had I had started the uh, ulnar drift and my fingers were curling and the knots and my, I could not, my, I couldn't unfurl my hands or I couldn't do anything with my hands. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was all gone. So that first medication did a great job of getting me back to, you know, kind of straight, even if it didn't get rid of all the pain, you couldn't, couldn't tell on the outside, which, and I was very vain about my hands. So it was nice to get some of my hands back. But as it goes on, your symptoms go in different directions. And the, some of the ones you had before don't come back up again. Some of the ones you had, you know, that you had all along get worse, they get better, they get worse. Um, and you go on different biologics because at some point you say, this is not working. So stop right there if you can for a moment and mm -hmm. share with us what were the signs that your symptoms had progressed beyond what the biological control. How did you know that the biologics that you were using weren't working? I was getting zero relief. And sometimes I can tell because I, I kind of live at a 6.5 to 7. That's where I hover on a daily basis. If I'm jacked up to 7.5 or 8 for more than a while, like it doesn't just go away, it kind of maintains that then we're talking, and so, and within a month or two, we're trying to figure out something. 7.5 to 8 milligrams of prednisone, I'm oh, assuming. Oh, no, no, I'm talking about on the pain scale level. Oh, <laughs> there we go. The two could yeah. be actually coincident. Yeah. So we utilize bridging strategies of steroids and treating patients on disease modifiers, and even with biologics, when patients are in flare, prednisone, methylprednisolone are used commonly as a bridging strategy toward the next drug. 
Yep. So you've been through several biologic therapies. We need not name them, but they've not necessarily provided sustained benefit for you. Right. Okay. Yeah. And you're now on two disease modifiers, which are doing an okay job, but not perfect? No, because I've actually got some new symptoms that are just like, whoa, I'm kind of exploding. So sure. I definitely need to go back on a biologic because I, I got to get some stronger stuff. So aside from the fact that there are oftentimes in patients with RA other elements, other disease states, or comorbid diseases, shall we say, mm -hmm. which influence disease activity, fibromyalgia, osteoarthritis, to name but a couple, we often know that patients are the smartest of any of us when it comes to the disease activity that they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And we often listen to our patients, those of us who take pride in what they do clinically, listen to our patients above and beyond the, the lab test data, x-ray evidence of disease yeah. activity, blood test results, and so forth. And that's given rise to new initiatives in drug development. And the reason I mention this is that the biosimilars that have come into play are very important. They're important considerations because of legislative agenda, yep. cost constraints, and the biologic diseases which they're used to treat. So let's talk, if we can, for a minute about bio biologics and biosimilars. I think we have to actually cut off for a second. So um, we can come back to this discussion, though, because I really want to have it about the biosimilars. Terrific. Um,